some of my earlier videos talked about controversies in the cladistic classification of dogs, cats, bats, monkeys, pterosaurs, and of course humans. And now, for whatever reason, I've recently gotten a few requests to do one on the evolution of snakes. Okay, I think that's an interesting story. Not just the evolutionary tree leading to snakes, but also their continued evolution within the tree of snakes. The snakes are reptiles, of course, while we are mammals, so we'll start with that. Uh, reptiles and mammals differ from amphibians and fish in that we develop in an amnion of amniotic fluid. And thus, collectively, reptiles and mammals are called amniotes. Where we and they part ways when what would become reptiles diverged from what would become mammals was way back in the Carboniferous period around 312 million years ago, when the first amniotes appeared in the fossil record as undifferentiated, initially amphibious reptiliomorphs. They were amphibious, but not amphibians. That's a different clade that also emerged at about the same time as an offshoot. The amniotes were tetrapods that developed keratinized skin to keep the inside wet and the outside dry and to avoid infection by osmosis. And they did the same with their eggs. Then this initial form immediately radiated into at least two major groups that still exist. This most basic form of amniote was an apsid, meaning that they had holes in their skulls for nostrils and for eyes, but that's it. Living on land has different requirements than living in the water, so another hole developed in the skull behind the eyes, called a temporal fenestra. This reduces the weight, offers a structural advantage, and allows a place to develop ears. Amniotes with a single temporal fenestra form a clade, or descendant lineage, called synapsids. And pelicosaurs, like Dimetrodon, are the most primitive synapsids. Dimetrodon is representative of the Permian period, but the earliest pelicosaurs appeared in the late Carboniferous, more than 50 million years before the first dinosaurs, and 100 million years before the first complete or true mammals. And there are quite a few intermediate fossils marking every stage of that transition. Now, if you were a pioneer scientist living in the 1800s, you probably would have called these mammal-like reptiles back then. But we understand the word reptile a bit differently now, especially now that we know that birds belong in that group too. About the same time that synapsids appeared, another group of amniotes opened two sets of temporal fenestrae instead of just one. And this began a clade of diapsids. All true reptiles, including dinosaurs, which include birds, belong in the diapsid clade. Even though dinosaurs opened a third set of fenestrae, which the earliest birds inherited, but then started filling in again due to aerodynamic stresses of flight. So we got reptiles. And remember that evolution is descent with inherent modification. So every new clade produces at least two different versions of whatever they were to start with, and usually more if you look at fossil forms too. Thus reptiles divided into two surviving daughter groups, archosauromorphs and lepidosauromorphs, and a few other groups that are now entirely extinct. Archosaurs include crocodilomorphs, phytosaurs, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and other similar things with way more diversity than you might imagine. Remember that everything alive today represents only about 1% of everything that has ever lived. The sheer volume of fossil families is quite impressive, but most of them are animals that only paleontologists know about. Sadly, the only archosauromorphs that we have left are birds and a few crocodilians. Oh, and turtles, because it turns out that turtles are also in that group, where they were once thought to be the last living anapsids. I used to think that myself until a couple friends of mine found a fossil form, a stem turtle with no shell yet, and it was originally diapsid. It still had two temporal fenestrae, but those holes closed up in later species as turtles returned to the sea and adopted more and heavier armor. I should have known better because one of the traits that typify archosaurs is that their eggs have hard but fragile shells, whereas the other group, Lepidosauromorpha, have softer, more pliable leathery shells, if they have shells at all, because many species give birth live. Sometimes even the same species will lay eggs in one part of the country, but will have live birth somewhere else. Or on rare occasions, the same individual might give birth live or lay eggs alternately. Snakes are lepidosaurs, and some of them give birth live, just like ichthyosaurs did back in the Triassic and Jurassic. Lepidosauromorpha has been defined as including every clade that is closer to lizards than to archosaurs. But we're using a more precise definition today, ignoring those close fossil groups that are technically outside of that clade. Since every parent category typically has at least two daughter sets, Lepidosauromorpha is divided first between Lepidosauria and Cuneosauria. And those were lizard-like reptiles that apparently used expanded ribs to glide between trees. They went extinct in the Triassic, while Lepidosaurus continued, dividing again between Rhynchocephalia and Squamata.
both of which evolved in the Triassic period along with the first dinosaurs. Rhynchocephalians were once a fairly diverse group with at least a few dozen fossil species living alongside dinosaurs, but now there is only one genus left, the last surviving sphenodont, the Tuatara, which is found only on remote islands of the South Pacific on or around New Zealand. The sphenodonts look like lizards, but differ from them in that lizards have a more flexible skull, one capable of cranial kinesis wherein there is a loose connection between the quadrate and adjacent bones, allowing the skull a bit of flexibility. A solid skull would enable a harder bite, but lizards can flex their jaws to engulf and swallow larger prey than a more rigid skull would allow. Lepidosauria is typified by a number of traits, including retention of a parietal third eye, right in the top of the head. It doesn't look like the other eyes, and it doesn't see like the other eyes either. All it does is distinguish light from dark, and respond accordingly by regulating production of a sleep hormone. And it also apparently aids in regulating body temperature, which is necessary when you're cold-blooded and depend on the sun to warm you up. You may not realize it, and you may never have noticed it, but many lizards actually have three eyes, with a cornea and retina and all of that. So do Rhynchocephalians, and many amphibians and fish have this trait as well, because it was derived from a common ancestor. And interestingly, if you look back to before Lepidosaurs evolved, back to the Permian or Carboniferous periods, you'll see that our own synapsid predecessors still had this trait way back then too. Archosaurs lost that trait, as did the lineage leading to mammals like us. Lepidosaurs also differ from archosaurs in their skin, with their overlapping keratin scales, which are structurally different from the scutes that are seen on some archosaurs, like the feet of dinosaurs, for example. Lepidosaur scales are part of the epidermis, or the outer skin, and can be peeled off together in whole or in part, and they have to be shed in order for the animal to grow, whereas the most an archosaur might do is molt. Uh, male lepidosaurs also have a hemipenis, meaning that instead of a single male organ, it's got two. And the most polite way I can describe their junk is to imagine a tuning fork. But really, it looks more like a biological horror of hente anime. Good thing they keep that tucked away where no one can see it. This is more in the squamates than sphenodonts, because the tuatara doesn't quite have the two-headed tentacle monster that squamates do. It only has the posterior pockets of the cloaca that are the evolutionary precursor to that Lovecraftian love story lizards live with. Snakes are squamates. The order Squamata includes lizards and snakes, as well as amphisbanians, also known as worm lizards. But a worm lizard is still a lizard. The evolutionary law of monophyly means that you can't grow out of your ancestry. So if snakes are derived from lizards, then snakes are lizards too, just a highly specialized variety of them. So the word squamate simply means lizard, snakes included. The fossil record shows that we've had lizards on this planet since at least the Middle Triassic. And remember that evolution is a theory of biodiversity, and lizards have since evolved into five or six thousand species, and that's if we're just counting the ones that are still alive, and we're not yet including snakes. Imagine how many more species must have come and gone in the last 240 million years since Megachirella. Because we found a lot of them in the fossil record, sure, but we'll never find every single lizard species that has ever lived everywhere around the world in every period of geologic history. We haven't even found all the ones that are still alive right now. So in the vast majority of lizards, whence do snakes emerge? Squamata can be characterized by a genetic propensity for an occasional reduction or loss of limbs, since several lineages within that group have either tiny legs or they've lost one pair of legs or they don't have any legs left at all. Extreme leg reduction has evidently happened dozens of times within skinks, anguids, and other lizards. For example, some species of skinks have legs that are so tiny that even if they could still function, it would be silly to try to use them, because a long enough lizard can do better without them. And then there's another group called blind skinks that don't have legs. And three species of amphisbanians still have long snaky bodies with no back legs, but they have these cute little front feet that they use for digging. Other amphisbanians have lost all their legs completely. And likewise, Australian pygopods are a sort of gecko that have no legs. At most, they just have flattened flaps in the back. The glass snake is called a snake, but it too is really just a legless lizard, in this case of the anguid family. The scientific name is Ophisaurus, which means snake lizard. It doesn't have the suite of unique character traits necessary to make it a true snake, and that becomes obvious when you watch it eat. 
because snakes eat differently than most other lizards do. Almost all snakes swallow the whole thing at once. They don't tear it apart or take bites out of it. Ophisaurs are also a more recent addition to serpentine fashion. Now, true snakes have been at it a lot longer, and one way we can tell that is by watching their development in embryo. As you can see, the Ophisaurus starts to grow leg buds, exactly the same as we see in a common lizard like the Anoli, but then growth stops, and the buds are mostly reabsorbed and maybe erupt as little more than scale flaps on an adult. We can't see that in true snakes without chemical assistance. As scientists have discovered a particular gene that has been found to be essential in embryological development, one that can be marked and directly observed in action. And because scientists are often nerdy, and some can even be a bit dorky, they named this gene after a video game that was popular at the time. So now scientists observed the expression of the sonic hedgehog gene in the embryonic development of a python. And they could see genetic expression for leg buds, but they were stopped and reabsorbed quickly and entirely. At this point, the only trace of limb development in true snakes is in the phallus, because the same gene that once allowed them to grow legs will now only allow a snake to grow a smaller snake. Even if the bodies of legless lizards and true snakes are seemingly identical, their heads give away whatever they really are. Gecko, worm lizard, anguid. I mean, look at this thing. It still has eyelids and ear holes. It obviously isn't a real snake. And neither is this thing, by the way. But this movie was made in England, and they have ophisaurs there, so I guess this is what they think a snake looks like. We can tell by looking at its head, the same way we can still recognize a snake, even if it had legs, because they found just the skulls and bits of vertebrae of some of the oldest and most primitive snakes, still sharing a few traits with lizards, just as you would expect going back that far. But regardless whether they even had legs, because we don't know if they did, their skulls still show their snakiness. And we can use those definitive features to identify which groups of lizards snakes are closest to. Not just the shape of the skulls and so on, but other features too. Like whether they have a propensity for venom. When I was a kid, half a century ago, textbooks used to say that the only venomous lizard was the Gila monster in the North American Southwest. Oh, and some variants of the Mexican beaded lizard, which is practically the same thing, both with neurotoxic proteins in their saliva. But then, as scientists improved their understanding of what venom is, they realized that there are actually a few other lizards, too, that have a relatively mild venom. I remember when the textbooks also used to say that monitor lizards like the Komodo dragon had a cocktail of bacteria in that frothing saliva dripping out of their mouths that would cause immediate infections in anyone who got bit by one. Then I got bit by one, a Malaysian water monitor, and I realized that, nope, that's a hematoxin that disrupts our blood clotting ability. In my case, the bite bled like water for two days. I had to keep it under a pressure bandage. And that was just from a glancing strike as I pulled my hand back when it struck. I still have a pair of scars running down my middle finger. If he had actually closed both jaws on me, then I wouldn't be able to adequately express my mood. Even if you could get loose from such a powerful bite, you'd be too weak from blood loss to get very far, and the lizards would just follow the trail to the fainting meal. Then the last thing you see, as everything goes dark, is a pack of these giant fork-tongued lizards coming at you like this. Years after that incident, scientists finally reclassified monitor lizards as venomous. They don't have fangs. So when they bite, they have to hold on tightly and maybe thrash around a bit to get that venom to drip down their teeth and into the wound. Gila monsters do the same thing. Their venom is as toxic as a rattlesnake, if you can get enough of it. But without fangs to inject it, they can't get that much into you unless they hold on for a while. If you get curious enough to let one bite you, just remember they're hard to pry off. And the longer they hold on, the worse off you'll be. Gila monsters are closely related to monitor lizards. They're both anguivores, as are a handful of legless lizards like the glass snake, Ophisaurus. Even popular pets like iguanas and bearded dragons, which are agamids, a subset of iguanids, are now considered to be mildly venomous, although their bite will usually just cause itchy skin or swelling if you happen to be allergic to it. The thing is, iguanids have an atrophied venom gland, a vestigial feature indicating that they were once more venomous than they are. And since iguanas and bearded dragons moved to vegetarian diet, the venom became largely unnecessary and eventually degraded, 
Looking at these groups of lizards collectively, we can see that anguomorphs and iguanids are classified together with serpentes in Toxicophora, a clade in which many, though not all, exhibit a genetic propensity to produce different types of venom. It is true that not all snakes are venomous, and whether the first one was or not, they're in a clade in which two genetic traits are commonly occurring, where venom has perhaps repeatedly been activated and where legs were repeatedly deactivated. Venom has evolved several times over biological history in many different animals, even among a few lineages of tetrapods. There is evidence of venom going back to Permian therapsids and in Paravian dinosaurs and even a few mammals. It's interesting that some lizards started to develop venom, but none of them completed the evolution of fangs, because another lineage does show that whole progression. One genus of archosaur from way back in the Triassic shows it all, the whole evolution, starting with grooves in the teeth like Gila monsters have, moving on to where that groove extends all the way to the tip, and then in later generations, in this case a more derived descendant species, that groove closes around the outside, becoming a hollow syringe. The advantage of that is that a tooth in the form of a hypodermic needle can allow venom to be forced through under pressure, so that you'll get a healthy dose, or rather a lethal dose, even if it only bites for a split second. And apart from this ancient archosaur, what other tetrapod has ever developed their teeth into such efficient venom-injecting fangs? Only snakes. And then only a relatively recent lineage of them, which we'll talk about in the next episode. For now, let's look at a little paleohistory, or the history of paleontology. Back in the 1700s, the first fossil ever recognized as an extinct animal was a mosasaur, a huge seagoing reptile with flippers instead of feet. Imagine how impressed those 18th century miners must have been discovering this skull 90 feet deep underground in a Dutch quarry. At first they thought it was a whale, but then Napoleon got a hold of it and he brought it to Georges Cuvier, the father of paleontology in France. And Cuvier examined the fossil and realized that, no, this is a lizard. Not a dinosaur, but an actual lizard, very similar to the Komodo dragon. And not just because it was so big, but due to a number of other traits too. The Komodo dragon is a varanid, a family of often large monitor lizards with a forked tongue, long neck, and mildly venomous bite, and it can take a pretty big bite. It has the ability to swallow things as big or maybe even bigger than its own head. Not quite exactly the way that snakes do, but very close. The biggest varanids today are often found in the water where they swim a lot like snakes do. So pioneer paleontologists quickly realized that the giant mosasaurs of the Cretaceous, of which many species are now known, must be very closely related to varanids. Varanids are very similar to snakes, too, not just with their forked tongues and propensity for venom, but varanids also have a glottis, not in the back of the mouth at the esophagus, but toward the front of the mouth, allowing them to cram whole long pieces of meat down their throat and still breathe. I think we can all agree that that's a beneficial mutation. It's like if you started with an embryo of a monitor lizard and then deleted genes for developing legs and eyelids and ears because snakes appear to have lost that parietal third eye and they lost the ability to close their eyes. They're open all the time, just shielded by a layer of transparent scale. And they don't have ears either, no external ears nor ear holes. They hear in low frequencies mostly through their jaws, which is how hearing evolved in the first place. There is also a semi-aquatic earless monitor in Borneo, which is said to be a little bit closer to snakes than the rest of Varanoidea. The similarity goes both ways, too. The genus Eophus, implying the dawn of snakes, is now recognized as one of the earliest snakes ever discovered. But the fossil of its teeth was initially interpreted to belong to an anguimorph, which is what the varanids are. There were so many anatomical similarities between snakes and varanids, and especially fossil mosasaurs, that in 1869, American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope classified mosasaurs and snakes together in their own clade, Pythonomorpha. This contradicted some noted experts of the day who had already identified another group of extinct fossil lizards, dolichosaurs, as being the ancestors of snakes, because some dolichosaurs looked like they were well on their way to becoming snakes. A century and a half later, and now we have genetic data to confirm that monitor lizards are indeed more closely related to snakes than they are to other lizards. But they're closer to Gila monsters than they are to snakes, so Cope's suggested clade of Pythonomorpha doesn't really work the way he described it. And that doesn't mean that snakes evolve from mosasaurs or varanids or varanoids. And for one reason, it turns out that iguanids are almost as close to snakes as varanids are. 
So Serpentes is between the two groups. Now the very closest kinship, genetically, taxonomically, might be a Shinosaur, which is right at the base of Aranoids, about where we would expect to find Dolichosaurs if this chart included extinct animals. It's like when they say that the closest living relative of whales is the hippo. It doesn't mean that whales evolved from hippos. What that means is there was once a common ancestor who didn't look like a whale and it didn't look like a hippo either, but that it led to a number of different species that would eventually become whales or snakes on one side and, and a number of other species on the other side that after successive evolutionary generations would produce many other species and after all that time the lucky last survivors of multiple extinction events were monitor lizards or hippos neither of which yet existed way back when the common ancestor did, nor did they necessarily look like the common ancestor did. We don't have DNA for Dolichosaurs because they're all extinct, but if we did have their DNA and we could test it, would they be even closer to snakes? Maybe, because Dolichosaurs aren't just similar to snakes, they're a lot like Mosasaurs too. They're like intermediate between both of them, but without DNA, the only way to know how close Dolichosaurs are is to find more descriptive fossils. So the question is, which of these groups is the closest to the crown or origin of the serpentine suborder Ophidia, also known as Serpentes? And part of what makes that question difficult is also what makes it largely superfluous. Because one of the laws of evolution is that the further back in time you look into biological history, the, cl the closer divergent branches are to their common ancestor, and thus the more similar they appear to be. And all of these groups are sister taxa. They're nested close together in about the same place in the phylogenetic tree of squamates already. And they don't have any modern descendants, so they didn't evolve many distinctions to set them apart. Thus, it hardly matters which group gave rise to snakes because they all look the same anyway. Only specialists can appreciate the minute distinctions that they find so critical and the rest of us can't see or wouldn't know. And sometimes even the experts have to study them closely before they can tell. For example, some paleontologists back in 2015 said that Tetrapodophus was definitely a four-legged snake, but others were just as definite that it was not. Another said she was trying to carefully sit on the fence as to whether this actually is a snake. And for the reason that a radical elongation of the body and reduction in size or loss of limbs has occurred so many times among squamates and other reptiles. By 2021, they seemed to have reached consensus that Tetrapodophus was most likely a Dolichosaur and not a snake, that Dolichosaurs are a sister group of snakes. Although in a sense, that form is also seen as a stepping stone to snakes. Scientists today refer to Dolichosaurs as non-Ophidian Ophidiomorphs, which means it's not quite a snake, really, but it's almost or mostly a snake. One species of Adriosaurs, which is sometimes classified with Dolichosaurs, has atrophied, malformed vestigial forelimbs, much shorter than their hind limbs. That's significant because while they've never found front legs on snakes, they have found fossils of four true snakes from 95 million to 100 million years ago that only have hind legs. They're fully developed, but greatly diminished, way too small to be useful, implying that their front legs were already pathetically puny as well before they disappeared altogether. That's the transitional form that everyone wants to find, something recognizable as a snake or a proto-snake further back in the fossil record, somewhere in the Jurassic, but a snake that still has all four legs, even if they're tiny. And the earliest snakes with functional feet on load-bearing limbs would have been short-bodied like any typical lizard. It's possible that they've already found that species. Parvoraptor and Diablophus date back to 144 million to 157 million years respectively. But both of these Jurassic snakes are known only from skulls and some vertebrae. No one yet knows whether they had legs or how long they were. Though they are roughly 60 to 70 million years older than the two-legged snakes we just talked about. So I'm betting that if someone ever finds a whole fossil of such a primitive serpent from that long ago, that it might not have to have crawled on its belly, that it could stand up to scrutiny. So that's the evolutionary tree to get to Ophidia, serpents, serpentes. And now that we've identified their point of origin about as close as I think we can reasonably expect to do under these conditions following an evolutionary tree to get two snakes, in the next episode we'll pick up from there to talk about the evolutionary tree of diversity within snakes.